Well, I tell you what, from the commentary box, you pick up so much that the pun- we try and give them as much information. Mm. For instance, that horse Shavut the other day. Shavut yes. and a couple of other horses. Once they go out of shot and there's so much that actually happens. It's yeah. frightening. You pick up on those things. And even a horse like Prince Vion, they go down to the start. You can see they stirred up and they're not on picture for a few seconds. Yes. And something goes wrong. And a lot of the time you try and give it to the punters. And like you mentioned, when you pick those things up and you're upstairs, you get a whole lot more information. Yeah, you get a lot, lot better view. Right? Welcome to another edition of Horses <laughs> to Follow in KwaZulu Natal. And goodness gracious me, uh, I think that our producer Tawanda Taravinga is so excited to have our bushy haired friend back that he's getting a little nervous behind the scenes. But uh, welcome to the Horses to Follow podcast with uh, myself and uh, Andrew Harrison. And our very important guest today is Sheldon Peters. We'll introduce him and welcome him in a moment. But I have to go straight to the jugular and. Uh, insult you for leaving me last week on my own uh, it was a very enjoyable show with corinne bestel but we did miss you no she saved your backside because she spoke very very well she so did she speak oh. well uh, and it's nice to have you back uh, no, well the weather was turn your back on us no, again. Well the weather was was bad it was, it was a bloody howling gale at ashburton i couldn't find my way to the car it was blowing so hard well we forgive you because we like you but please don't do that again no oh. welcome back andrew harrison sheldon lovely to have you with us at our podcast the first time that uh, you're on our show and it's a great pleasure to have you with us welcome no thanks very much nice to be on the show and that and obviously different side of things first time to get into the nitty-gritty of things and get to know me quite a bit better and that so really looking forward to it and hopefully the viewers get something out of it perfect mgt solar as are our sponsors we acknowledge them we thank them for their sponsorship and uh, we will touch on their you know what they do and how they do it uh, in a moment but I, I think we're, we're excited we don't want to waste any time we want to go straight to the jugular and, and f- find out about what makes Sheldon tick um, the question I ask everybody rewind the clock r- r- till when you were a youngster when you were born and, and, and you know you can't remember it, that far back he <laughs> he's, not, he's not that old he's only uh, how old are you actually I can remember 120 years back I'm 42 40, <laughs> 42. 42 but I okay. can remember 102 years back no, it's one of those reincarnated books uh, <laughs> 42 that's right you and I are the same age uh, you're, a bit, you're a bit older than 42 you're 52 I'm retiring soon <laughs> okay 52 retired how did it all start for you I love I always ask that question but how right from the beginning talk to us well, the day I was born, the doctor rubber stamped me. He said, you're going to be in racing, and that's it. So basically, at around about seven or eight years old, I wanted to be a jockey. I saw the racing okay. on the TV, and I admired Kevin Shea and all the top jockeys watching them in action. And watching Flaming Rock win the Rothmans July those days, that set everything in motion. So that was the turning point in my life. I decided racing was going to be my forte. I wanted to be a jockey. Elephants in the Kruger National Park was the closest <laughs> I was going to get. So I went to plan B, commentating and presenting. Sheldon, at that stage, your dad was commentating, was he? I mean, yes. you, from your youngster, your, your young, your, you know, from your youth, when do you, did you take notice of that? Hey, this is dad's job. And when did you well, take notice of He didn't have much choice, did he? No, he didn't have much choice. <laughs> no. no, but I'm saying, you know, when you're a small kid, you know, you don't notice what your folks are doing. But then when did this penny drop and say, geez, that's an interesting job? Well, I can tell you from a young age, the race card was out. And I used to take that race card to school. So mm. nine years old, 10 years old. Okay. The first thing that was packed before the lunch, before the school books, anything was a race card. And yes, obviously the racing and watching the racing on the TV. I and mean, every time my dad went to the course, I used to listen, find out what's happening and just get the gist of it. And certainly it grew day on day. And from there, I never looked back. Did your mom or dad ever sway you in and try and sway you in another direction? Say, look, don't get into horse racing. Try and do this. 
Yes, a very, very good question. A lot of people would say, rather stay out of racing, become a doctor, become a lawyer, a dentist, something else. A bloody boring. <laughs> yeah, very, absolutely. very boring. I said, to me, racing is the only way to go. I was a punter at the age of nine already. I started gambling in that. I was really entrenched in racing. So there was not, not, never going to be anything else but racing in my blood. It was in my blood. And my family, they, they're from Joburg. A lot of Lebanese in the bloodline there. So all the gambling and that's all there. And yes, racing was always going to be for me. It's, it's an amazing. We, we talk to all our guests and we hear these, these stories. And it's just a, it's a, it's a, it's a sickness, but we love it. We, it's I, not I, a I sickness, it, man. It's a... <laughs> <laughs> You don't let me finish my sentence. It's a sickness that we love. It's a sickness that we want. It's a, it's a, it's a disease that we just we can't get enough of it. And you hear from Sheldon, you heard from Corinne, I'm just using, we heard from Julie Dittmer, that once the bug's bitten, you can do what you like. Maybe we should vaccinate you. <laughs> I don't want to be vaccinated. The only thing I want to be vaccinated against is the coronavirus, and I'm halfway there. But, I mean, I did, uh, again, I always say the show's not about me or you, it's about all of us, but I did 12 years in the hospitality trade, and... I went back into racing because, as Sheldon says, once you're in that in that stream, once that bug is bitten, it's hard to stop. No, that's right. Yeah, but listen, there's not a more uh, exciting profession. I mean, if you're involved in this game, um, you do, it is a it is a disease, I'm afraid. Yeah. yeah, and it's a good disease. Now, Sheldon, tell us about your schooling. Where did you matriculate? Where did you go to school? I went to Hillcrest High, matriculated in 1996, uh, yeah, back in the good old days. I was a failure at school, total flop. If I got 40%, I was over the moon, oh, just I. getting over the pass rate in that. As long as the race book was with me, the ticky box was outside, so at break time I could go phone for the race in that. Yes. Marks didn't matter to me. I had my head firmly entrenched, I was going racing, so English was obviously important, because I needed to know the English language and horses' names and colours jockeys and that's all that really mattered at that stage of the game school to me i threw out the back window <laughs> and i said one day i'll look back and i'll definitely not regret that <laughs> yeah. Yeah, talking about schooling and he's saying he was happy to scrape through 40 percent. i did standard nine twice so i failed standard nine i'm not surprised um, <laughs> it was the best two years of my life and uh, because uh, th that year that I failed was the year that I had my most profitable time punting, <laughs> but that <laughs> uh, was a long time ago. So, yeah, you, 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 interesting to hear you say that you look back and you regretted none of that. So that's interesting. Now, talk about your family. You mentioned that, you, you know, you come from a Lebanese community. But first of all, start off with your immediate family, your wife and kids, and, and you know, then branch out after that. Yeah, I met my wife 20 years ago. So it was a coincidence through a friend through racing. We met at a nightclub in those days, the good old days when you could go out and have a proper party and I met her 20 years ago and then we dated for a few years, got married, moved out of home and then we had two wonderful daughters. My one daughter is 10 years old, about to turn 11 okay. and the other daughter is 5, her birthday is in a few days time so she'll be turning 6 and I promise you two daughters, they really keep you on your toes. So it's been a real eye opener and the one loves racing. And the other one, she's more into the Barbies and the makeup and that sort of stuff. So you, you she wants even, a unicorn. You haven't even got started yet, <laughs> I promise you. Once the dating starts, I believe that's when the real so trouble starts. Get, a yourself, get yeah. yourself a Rottweiler and a shotgun. Now, um, do... No more. No more kids. Two is, is two your chop. You have two girls. Are you going to try for a son? You were talking about the breeding season. My breeding season stopped five years ago. Okay, so the breeding season's closed. Okay, all right, that's lovely. And then talk about your, 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 the, your greater family in the sense your mom and your dad and your sister and, and tell us about them. Yeah, well, my dad was obviously involved in racing from a young age from Joburg. He used to go stand in the, in the trees those days because kids weren't allowed on course. So he used to go watch from the binoculars in Gauteng there, Turfentine, and practice commentating in the trees. And then he met my mom, obviously, they got together. We lived in Joburg for about two years. Then we moved to KwaZulu-Natal. My dad was offered the position, yeah, he worked alongside Trevor Denman and, of course, Eric Denman in the good old days. And things from there just started to map out. We moved to Waterfall. We were there for 20 years. 
and yeah, basically being entrenched in the, the hometown now. Tell me something. Did your dad take part in those Lebanese riots on the Serpentine? I think he missed out on them. I think he was tied up. I think he was tied to the chair with the cable ties <laughs> those days. So he wasn't allowed to be out there on the track and that, but I'm sure he was looking on from behind. What, what happened in those days? What, what was hey, that? boy, if you made a, the Stubbs made a mistake or the jockeys made a mistake, the boys went berserk. That was when they used to have a few people on course. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, just talking about, uh, and so before I, uh, pitch a question to Andrews and, and it's just you and your sister is that right it is you two sisters two sisters yeah okay. two sisters okay. I'm the eldest and I've got my two younger sisters okay. one sister was a karate buffer wasn't she? she well the whole family my dad was a boxer he used to box with Floyd Tawil and the boys in Joburg so the as they called them the sterikers in those days they used <laughs> to get stuck into each other in the streets and that and then yeah I got my black belt my dad's a second Dan and my sister I think's close to a third Dan she traveled okay. around the world doing karate yeah, and that, I remember that so yeah. kickboxing yeah. karate you name it we there a silly question maybe but talking about karate and, and martial arts and all, and all those things do you still if, I don't know if practice is the right word but do you still I mean do you still practice or do you still go do you still do karate or is it something that's sort of on the shelf for now well, once we had kids, everything got put on the shelf okay. for a while besides racing. Okay. I got a boxing bag and a little gym at home that I still train. Okay. So if a horse gets beat on the day, I get home and the boxing bag it's gets it. Okay, yeah, yeah, I can right. imagine. Yeah, yeah, I know the feeling. But now, okay, but, but it's, it's like riding a bicycle. Once you can do your moves, you, you, you know, you, whether you don't practice it, you can do your moves. I mean, if you were stuck in the street and you needed to fight for your survival, it was, it's instantaneously, surely. 100% right. Yeah. You, you put somebody in front of me, they, they, yeah, they put it down to you and you're going to come back to your A game. Okay. Obviously, I'm not going to do the splits these days. The <laughs> elasticity is out of me. But yeah, put me toe to toe, we can go there. Okay. I I did karate once at school. They used to teach you how to punch. My shoulders never recovered. <laughs> <laughs> you know, talking about, you know, Sheldon saying boxing bags and, and martial arts and all that. <coughs> um, just an interesting thing. I, I, I've, because you can see by the size of my tank, I'm getting fatter and fatter. And I, I've started to do a little bit of, of gym and boxing as well. And I'm thoroughly enjoying it. But you're right. You find out about joints and muscles and shoulders and things that you didn't know existed. And my fault was that when I was a kid, I never ever did any exercise. I was the laziest bugger you'll ever meet. And, and now that I'm starting to exercise in my 40s, that's my body's having none of it. But you're right. I can hear what you're saying about your buggered up shoulder yeah. because uh, you've got to be fit for these things, you know. Talking about commentators, uh, you heard Sheldon mention Trevor Denman, Eric Denman, uh, obviously his dad, Craig, and, and but. From your side, you remember all those legends, and even before that, in your yeah, yeah, when I when I started racing, Ernie Ernie Duffield was the sort of the kingpin of the of the commentary box. Um, but they used to call him Machine Gun Ernie. He just used to call them flat out <laughs> right from right from the <laughs> beginning to the end. Okay. I mean, when when I was when we lived in Swaziland in those sort of stages, we used to listen to the, the the July commentary on the radio, and also between half time in the rugby matches okay. at 10 minutes they used to SABC used to switch over to to racing commentaries and then we have Ernie and Peter Duffield I, I thought Peter Duffield was far superior to his old man okay because uh, he could actually paint a picture Ernie was just fired away uh, okay uh, okay interesting and then, yeah, then we got we got Trevor and and, and Eric uh, Eric and and I believe Eric's un yeah. unwell is that right Eric's unwell no, Eric's right. Yeah, yeah, okay yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, uh, you speak to Eric fairly often, and you speak, you can contact with Trevor fairly often. Or, yeah, or Trevor Dem and myself. The horse yeah, ran yesterday, contact. I think. Good second, Lord Good of second. the Manor. Right. We're in contact yeah, yeah, quite yeah. often. Yeah. Mm. Um, okay, there was something else I wanted to ask you, but it escaped me. I'll come. It'll come back to me in You're a definitely moment. Definitely not going to be a commentator. You can't remember the colours. <laughs> <so yeah. laughs> Sheldon, you know, there's one thing that we must talk about, and it's something that used to irk me quite a lot but it doesn't anymore because as we go and we learn and, and we we understand the life uh, i've learned to handle it but criticism we all get criticized you know whether you're a journalist and in andrew's case he's written a, a, a dreadful article if uh, i'm a presenter never never written a dreadful article. <laughs> uh, we all get criticized not in the last know? century at least yeah, not no, in the last no, century. No, no. Yeah. Um, how do you handle criticism because i used to take i mean i used to take it badly now i just have to laugh it off or else i'll go insane how do you deal with it there's two things i've learned in life constructive criticism i take on the nose if you're going to give me something constructive that i can work on like when I speak to Trevor Denman and my dad and they give you pointers and they point you in the right direction, more than welcome. Keyboard warriors who sit on the couch and they talk from their pockets and from their 
their own whatever mindsets they are, I've got no time for those type of people. If you've got constructive criticism, my door's wide open. You can phone me, I'll spend two, three hours on the phone. What can you change? What can I do to accommodate? How can we do things? Plenty of time for that. For people who are on the other side and they're one-sided, I haven't got time for those type of people. No, it was just to smoke, blow smoke up your bottom. I thought you called very well yesterday. Well, thank you very much. Hopefully the punters had the winners. <laughs> Absolutely. But now, you know, it's good that because in this whole world that we live in, everybody just wants to kill everybody and, and I'm tired of it. And you're right. We all make mistakes. I've said it like blue in the face. We're all humans. We're not robots. We're all humans. No, we all make it's mistakes. It's a strange sort of human tray. I mean, you, you got... I was reading an article the other day about the jockeys in England. That, you know, the, the posts they get on social media. I mean, they're bloody horrific. Man. Horrific. I mean, there was... A, there was I, I was reading on MJ Bailerfeld's... Uh, look at the lovely babies. Uh, sorry, we at Summerfeld Clubhouse, as you know, where we record our podcast and there's a lovely string of babies coming down the track. But just going back to... I was reading on MJ Bailerfeld's post. There was a gentleman that wrote it on Facebook uh, about... I think it was Grant Van Eekhoek. The most despicable. In fact, I mean, the man should have been pulled apart the most disgusting bringing his family into it and his children into it and i mean what the, the, it's yes. just if something's not right there i mean you just don't behave like that so you've pulled, you've said it right i think that's the only way to do it yeah if well you just got to ignore it i mean it's, it's, it's simple as that as sheldon says you've got to take the criticism if it if it was justified fair enough Absolutely. But, but, but if, if it wasn't you're just being you just damn right it. nasty then you've yeah, got to no, I've, I've, I've lived long ago but you don't get up in the morning as a journalist or as a racing analyst or whatever and say, well, I want to write a bad article and go and write a bad... You don't wake up in the morning and say, I want to go and bugger up every commentary because you love what you do. Yeah. I don't wake up in the morning and say, well, I want to go and present a bad day. Uh, we love what we do. Mm. So, you know, people have got to understand that. But that's good advice. So if it's constructive, you're most welcome. If it's just being damn right nasty and talking from the pocket and one-sided, you ignore one thing I also learned very well, because we had horses earlier on, we owned a couple of race horses, so when they came off the track, we used to gallop them at home. We had a nice strip of about six, 800 meters, so from a point of view of riding and that, I know jockeys get criticized quite often in that, I've galloped horses to their tilt. I've really galloped them and got into no horses, and I know the, I worked with Glenn, the horse whisperer, yes, and he worked yes. with the horses off the track and that. There's a lot of criticism, constructive criticism. If you ride a bad race, it's a bad race, you rectify it. But jockeys come in for a lot of criticism, unless you've actually sat on a horse, I promise you, you won't, you'll know the difference. 500 kgs of horsepower, what they want to do, they'll do. Yeah. If they oblige and they do what you want them to do, it's only part of the parcel. But if they're not going to do what you want them to do, it's about placing them, get them in the right positions and that. But 500 kgs of horse flesh, Hard I promise come, yeah. you, you come off second best nine out of ten times. Yeah, 100%. It's, uh, I, re I read an article, not I read an article, I, I've heard somebody saying that, and I won't mention names because it's just... Uh, Why it's, not? No, no. We wouldn't have a dig. No, we don't want to have a dig <laughs> at all. They were just saying that, oh, that race they watched a couple of months ago, the jockey jumped off. Can you, I mean, can, would you drive your car at uh, 100 kilo, or 80 kilometers an hour, open the door and jump yeah, out? Was, I wouldn't. I was trying to think, there was, there was a, I forget his name, it was an English jump jockey. Uh, he was being criticized for, for, for bailing. So he, he got the bloke, he actually phoned him up and he said, come. He That's said, right. no, no, get in the back of the bucky. And when we get to 60 kilometers an hour, you jump out. <laughs> jump out, yeah, jump <laughs> off at 60 kilometers. Yeah. And the Oaks, I remember, he said, no, 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 no I'm not going to no, jump no, off no, the back of it. Do you think I'm going to jump off my horse at that speed? Yeah. You know, if, anyway. Okay, so that's good advice for criticism. Now, let's talk about how do you, pre how do you prepare for it. Now, let's, let's put you in your presenting role. So, so well, l let me ask you this question. Which do you prefer? Do you prefer presenting or do you prefer race calling? Well, it's a mixture. There's a, there's a different adrenaline you get from both of them. Presenting's for me, it's a lot easier. A lot more studying goes into it as far as the form lines and that sort of thing. When it comes to pressure, commentating, obviously the pressure of commentating, and there's a lot of money at stake. And when you're calling a race, and if you don't want to make a mistake, sure. if you call the wrong horse home, which touch wood, I haven't called the wrong horse home yet, probably going to come one of the days. But at this stage, luckily, I haven't called the wrong horse home yet past the post. But there's a lot of pressure when it comes to calling a race, especially the Vodacom Durban July and the feature races. There's a lot at stake. And you know when there's money at stake, the punters are out there, the owners, the trainers. It goes worldwide to 52 countries around yeah, the world. Yeah. 
So commentating, the pressure's on. So if you have two or three nights and you've had a, a bad week, you're a little bit fluey and you're sick and you're not feeling 100% on the day, you just got to make sure that you've studied your colors, you've put in your hard work. So when it comes down to choosing between the two, presenting's a lot more relaxed. I really enjoy the presenting side, but when it comes to the commentating side, that's my real passion. Okay, okay, lovely. You know, talking about Sheldon saying he, he touched what he has and called the wrong horse home and... I think it was either Brandon Bailey or Alistair Cohn who speak openly about it that they unfortunately have had that experience where they call the wrong horse home. Ah, yes, they started previewing the wrong race. Happens, you know, we make mistakes, we make errors. Oh, but well. For uh, you, I can excuse you. <laughs> <laughs> I know, we all, I'm a bit mad. But but so I, I remember, uh, I think it was Francois Vorfort. I think it was, Fra it was Francie uh, calling the Summer Cup in Joburg. Okay. And he got, he got the horses mixed up, he got the colours mixed up, he was calling it on the radio. And the horses were really... 200 meters past the post that he was trying to get his thoughts in before he gave the result. I mean, <laughs> but you could do it in those days. It was, it was on radio, not television. Okay. The problem technology these days has taken over. You can't get away with anything no. now. The technology, the different angles they got, I mean, it's unbelievable. Yeah, well, the Summer Cup was extra two, extra furlong. So <laughs> <laughs> your, your preparation for presenting then, uh, you, you happy to say it's just basically studying your form. Is that your preparation? Watching you? races, okay. studying the form. I learned quite a long, long time ago, there's a good phrase that somebody taught me. Eight to five pays the bills. Six to 12 and 12 to six builds your empire. So that's where I, I study my form throughout the night. I'm a non-sleeper. Uh, you, you don't sleep? Throughout my, career, throughout my life, I've been a non-sleeper. If I get two, three hours sleep a night, that's a lot. A good night's sleep for me. So Jeez. I basically run on adrenaline. You get to the course there. You make sure you're as razor sharp as you can be. But it's become part of my life nowadays. I mean, three hours sleep, you're up, you're on the computer form, you're on the computer, you're on the phone, you're getting the betting, you're studying your colors. So it's become a way of life for me. Jeez. So we're different. Huh? Jeez, that's interesting. Eight, eight o'clock, I can't keep my eyes open. <laughs> I can't get out of bed <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> Six o'clock, I can't open my eyes. But, it's, but it's an interesting point that you make. And it's an interesting point that I, 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 it's a, I keep drumming, beating in the same drum. Everybody's different. Everyone's yeah. made up differently. Yeah. Everybody does things differently. Everybody... But I wish, I wish I could l last on three hours, Kip. Oh. <laughs> and, and, and look at him. He's razor sharp, bright eyed and bushy tail. Oh, look at us. We're so doff. We can't do <laughs> That's what I like to think. Others might differ. <laughs> so now, Sheldon, you are, okay, so you're studying, so you're, you're presenting, you're studying your races, watching your replays. And of course, it's also a quiet time because the kids are sleeping, the wife is sleeping, you know, you've got the TV to yourself, you've got everything. So, okay. And then for race calling, pretty much the same thing. You're still studying the form now, you're looking at colors and you. you Tell us a bit about that. How do you prepare for a calling day? Yes, for the race meeting, obviously when the, the race card comes out, you go through the names and the colours and you make sure you've got the right draws. Well, in the tell, it's quite easy now with the draws and that. Obviously, it's become a lot easier. You know, gate one's number one, gate two's sure. number two. Whereas in the olden days, you, where there were 20 horses at Clearwood and that and they used to jump out, it was a minefield those days. Yeah. That, those were the tough days. Nowadays, we've got a lot easier. We've got the, the HD and all the, the visuals brought to you. So it's, it's actually, it's become a little bit easier, if you can say easier, whereas yes. commentary is not easy. But the, with the visuals and the technology and that, it's a little bit simpler. And as long as you know your horse's colors, your horse's names and everything, like just a matter of example, sometimes there's five or six horses in the same silks. Sure. I remember when the Eusta silks used to be out. There used Yo. to be sometimes six or seven runners in the same race with the same colors. And they just used to change the caps. And that's obviously on the way down to the start to get to know the, ch the cap changes. So then you just got to study the caps and make sure you got the right horse at the right time and hope the right one arrives. And that is, must be a hell of a thing. And funny, my dear old mother, who's 70 odd, uh, said to me the other day driving in the car, she said, how do these gentlemen remember all this and i said to her mom well I, I don't know i said i suppose it's how does a pilot know to fly an airplane how does a heart surgeon know to cut yeah how does a you yeah, know well, well they obviously uh, don't dope so that's fine yeah. <laughs> so but you're right because it, it puts you on the on the edge because now you've got five or six horses coming at you with the same colors now you've got to try and remember the different caps so it must be a hell of a thing you know uh, you've got to take your hat off to the guys you no know, it's, it's not an easy it's job not, not an easy criticize job as much as you like it's not easy not easy now You've owned racehorses, you touched on that. Uh, had some success, had a couple of winners? Yes, we've had at least about 12 winners. We had horses, uh, we had a horse called King of Cool who came from the late Buddy Maroon. We had it with Wendy Whitehead and Duncan McKenzie when they were here. 
He came here as a has-been. They thought he was over the top. He came here. We turned him around. He ended up a five-time winner. And interesting enough, Brandon Arena won his first, I think, three or four wins on him. Okay. He was an out-and-out thousand-meter horse. He loved Clearwood. Bad legs. But when the rains came, different horse. Jeez. So, yeah, we had him who... He did us very, very proud. He was the horse that we actually took off the track and we kept him till his last day. So King of Cool, he was the gem in our eyes. And then we had a horse called Dante's Peak. We okay. had Jarvis Spice, a horse called Devonesque, who wanted 100 to 1 with Nicky Roebuck at Scottsville the one day. And I'll <laughs> never forget a horse. popular then. <laughs> <laughs> and then a horse called Golden Dapple, who Golden first Dapple. time out, actually a very interesting story. On my wedding day, Golden okay. Dapple was making his debut. Sean Cormack was riding him, and they said, you make sure you get to Scottsville, he won't miss first time out. We backed him from seven to one to even money. My best man drove me to the course. We got there just in time for the race. He ran 17 lengths last. Oh my gosh. We flew back for the wedding. We had the wedding. Everything went according to plan. Next time he beat a million rand horse from the Mark de Cox stable, I called the race, he won three parts of a length on the bridle. So <laughs> it shows you this game from 17 lengths off, expected to win, second time out he came cruising in. So yeah. it's just one of those things, yeah, name is, of the yeah. game. Sheldon, um, I, was told, I was told on my wedding day, if I see a computer form or I see a, your cell phone with DSTV, there's going to be a divorce before <laughs> the wedding. <laughs> oh, must have been all of us, I, I went to the races too. Did you also get the race on your wedding day? Saturday. Oh, I, I disappeared, so I didn't have to do any of the organisation. But you gentlemen are, are, are long time married. Hey? You got married a long time ago. I'm recently married, so I was told no computer forms, no nothing. But uh, I made sure the wedding day was on a day where it was out of province racing. <laughs> Let's talk about your international experience, because you have had some. Elaborate on that. Well, my wife's family majority are from England, so most of them do stay in England. We went over there for a holiday. And she made the arrangements for me to call with Simon Holtz at Linkfield. So I went to Linkfield. I called two races on the card. And lucky enough, they invited me back for the next two meetings to call three or four races. So it was an unbelievable experience. It was a synthetic surface, so absolutely amazing. And the weather there, you know, it can get very dark, rainy, misty. And they also had seven or eight different camera angles. So I was pushing through the buttons. I had the last horse. I was trying to find the front horse. At least everything went down very, very well. So it was a brilliant experience. And on my list is to go and call in America. I've got to go to America before my days are up. That's on my bucket list. And talking to Trevor Denman and going through the motions, I've always wanted to call it Santa Anita. That's been in my blood since a youngster, in the back of my mind. Always would, get to Santa Anita. He, so he, he'd be able to organize something like that. I mean, you'd be able to, you know, when the time's right, he would be able to, to sort that out, surely. Yes, well, uh, a couple of years back, he gave up Santa Anita, and we were, were looking to go over there, but obviously with the restrictions and a lot of things on the go, having kids, not that easy. So we elected to stick here, the home province. I believe South African racing is one of the best in the world. I've absolutely loved it from day one. And if we can just get everything back to where it was again, I believe it's one of the best in the world. I agree with this with uh, Sheldon's comment. We we've got a good product. No, we have, and, yeah, and, and we certainly uh, can get it to where it should be. Yeah. There's no doubt about mm. that. That that was my also going to be one of my other questions is, and you don't have to answer it if you don't want to. Travel. I mean, interna if you if you've got an opportunity in a couple of years' time to maybe pick up to pick up the family and go overseas, and uh, would you maybe would you consider something like that? Over the last couple of years, we have been considering it. Obviously, with family over there, the wife wants to go yes, to the UK, yes. and I've had a few opportunities that side, which, yeah, we've put on hold for the time being. This is my hometown. I don't want to leave South Africa. I love it here. And like I mentioned, I've watched racing all over the world. There's top-class racing in that. But from a youngster, I've always been entrenched here in South Africa. The racing year, I just find it quite different to the rest of the world. There's something that you can't get from the rest of the world here. Yeah. And I'd love to stick here and hopefully things work out in the long run. But you can never, never rule out an opportunity sure. overseas. I mean, the Hong Kong racing and all over the world, there's top class racing out there. And if the opportunity had to come, certainly worth looking into. You um and your dad are, are different callers. You know, anyone can, that can hear and, and watch races, you, you've got different styles, you've got different... But one thing pertinent about you is that you certainly, you can hear it in your voice, 
your dad's a brilliant commentator and you're a very brilliant commentator and as andrew complimented you we need to give compliments in this world we, we it's too much negativity but you i'm not saying for one second that the other commentators and your dad is, are not exciting when they call but when you listen to you there's that extra thrill and excitement that's the point i'm making you agree with what i'm saying 100 percent. a lot of people have said i'm very different a lot of people don't enjoy it but majority do i'm different i'm unique in a different way i bring that extra excitement it's just the passion that comes through Correct. you can't help yourself you 100 percent. a lot of people say you back nine winners on the card because you get so excited for the nine races where can you back nine, nine winners, winners on yeah. the card <laughs> i'm quite selective when i have go. my bets <laughs> there we go try, but we don't often <laughs> succeed yeah yeah so i'm very selective when it comes to having a punt in that so i don't bet every race I'm quite disciplined, which I learned from a young age. One of the few things that I am disciplined in, having wow. a punt when I really want to have a punt. Please, so. please teach me because I'm so not disciplined. But anyway, we'll get there. But yeah, so it's, it's, that, it's that passion. It's the thrill. It's the enjoyment coming through. As I say, you know, I'm not saying that the other commentators are not passionate in you, but everyone's different and unique. Yeah, but no. you know, as you say, it's painting that picture. You've got to paint that picture. If you're listening on the phone, you know. Okay. Um, what advice could you give some punters? As you say, well, you probably that's probably a, be selective, but you answer the question. What advice would you give punters? Well, you've got to study your form. I know a lot of the people, they got eight to five jobs, so they haven't got the time to study. They get home, they've got a family to look after, they open up the race book. And a lot of people just look at the betting and the jockeys and the, the top horses at the top of the boards. For me, it's a case of I spend at least six to ten hours on each and every card. You go through the merit ratings, you watch the replays, and I've got a black book with a number of horses that you wait for. When those horses run, you might have backed them the last four or five runs, but when they come right, you make sure you've had a good bet and you make all your money back. Yeah, that's, a good, that's, that's, that's good thinking and a good strategy. Do, um, do you believe in luck? Do you, is, it, is it a bit of luck involved as well? Do you, do you believe you've got to have a bit of luck on your side too? You've got to have luck on your side. I mean, I went through a, a purple patch where I could do no wrong. Everything I was touching, 20 to 1, 33 to 1, they were all arriving. And then you go through your periods of three, four weeks where no matter what you oh. do, the horses will get blocked, <laughs> they'll get knocked over, yeah. they'll find traffic problems. Everything that will go wrong will go wrong. And I've had that run of late where everything goes wrong, the horses get entangled, the reins go loose, the saddle slips. So it's all about luck in the game. But the main thing is this, that you enjoy it. If you're willing to put your money down, you're willing to lose the money. That's the main thing. Yes, you've got to yeah, be able yeah. to afford to lose the money. I don't believe in putting your rent money on horses because you come unstuck and then it puts a lot of pressure on you. Sure. I enjoy gambling. If the horse gets beat, it's my money on the horse and I'm willing to take it on the chin. Uh, that's, good. that's good sound advice, I think. Yeah, yeah well, the, the, the whole thing is don't spend money that you can't afford. 100%. Yeah, absolutely. What is that four-leaf clover you've got there? Talking, we're talking <laughs> about <laughs> luck now. All of a sudden, there's a four-leaf clover that's arrived. Yeah, well, I'll there we go. We've uh, got to take a pick six on Sunday, boys. Yeah, I, g I gave Della two of these yesterday. Yeah, well, they, they had, had Della, one winner. Dunks. Della Ravine, yeah, Ravine, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, well, they had a winner yesterday, so well, it must work. Well, we found a plant now. There we go. Uh, okay. I, and I spoke to, to Mace this morning. Because he, you know, he, he puts the, on his horse. Yes, on his horse. Yes, yes, yes. Four leaf clover. Four leaf clover. Yeah, and he, he was telling me, he said he still got his one when he was, he had the Toto in England. And okay. uh, he was taking it out for a graze or something like that. And he found a four leaf clover. So he still got it on his, in his wallet. So Jeez. there we go. Okay, that's interesting. Okay. Uh, you've touched on, on karate, etc. But do you have any other hobbies besides horse racing and karate? Anything else that you interested in? I was you? big into my soccer. I went to the top in soccer. Crickets, I loved a number of different sports, so okay. except rugby. The only thing I didn't play was rugby. Okay. I enjoyed my soccer more, kicking the ball around and throwing it around. I know most of my, most of my friends in that, they rugby fanatics. They absolutely love their rugby. Me, soccer, I'm a soccer fanatic. And Charles, this is your commentating, presenting is your, your main job, your main income, your main employment. That's, everything that's is everything. racing. Everything revolves around racing, so... We need to keep this game going that we love so much. Everything's racing. I live, eat, sleep, breathe. Everything's all about racing. Have you had any embarrassing moments in the game? I mean, whether it's calling, presenting, punting, or just in general conversation, any mistakes or embarrassing moments? Nothing really big that I can talk about. Obviously, during the line, you make a few little errors here and there. But, I mean, nothing that really sticks out off the page. But... We're all human, we do make the error here and there, but there's nothing that really sticks off the page to me as a, as a big, big mistake or that sticks out. So at this stage, we'll touch wood and just like I said, never call the horse 
wrong past the post yet that could be second on the bucket list you have uh, <laughs> have you had any mistakes and errors and funny oh, moments plenty plenty <laughs> plenty <laughs> mistakes yeah. Yeah, uh, oh, I just hope people don't read the newspapers. <laughs> It'll be all right. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I think I'm getting a little deaf in the old age because yesterday there was a, a jockey change. I think Samanga Kamala got off a ride or he got stood down or something. And there's two Bob. You know, you obviously you're on air. You in the number one box and backwards and forwards. And uh, I think Ashton Aries picked up a ride somewhere. I didn't hear it. There was no communication through the speakers. I never heard it. But it happens. I mean, it's a mistake. It's little errors that. As I say to you, none of us wake oh, up in the morning. You made a bloody huge blooper. What did I do? That, no, I said you haven't yet. No, no I haven't made a yet. big I mean, uh, well, I, Everyone's tipped uh, or spoken about a scratched horse. At least I didn't say it went down to post well. Yeah. <laughs> At least I, <laughs> That's but, happened. Huh? Yeah, but uh, unfortunately, these little errors happen. I mean, it's and, and it happens to, the, to, to, to absolutely anybody. As I said, we are human. We, make, I'm a, we all make errors out of sight of horse racing too. You know, that's just one of those things. The unfortunate thing is the added pressure now with the COVID in that. It's put a lot of extra pressure, pressure on a lot of people in that. Yeah. I mean, it's not the same as the good old days. The good yes. old days, you used to go there, you're all in good spirits. Now you got to, you're listening to people that are, yeah, they're under the weather and that. Yeah. And things aren't going according to plan and you're trying to, trying to cheer them up as much as possible. There's a lot more pressure these days. 10, yeah. 15 years ago, the pressure was a lot less especially when you've got kids and that and trying to put them through school and yeah. all your loved ones, your families and everything. Yeah. Times have certainly changed and I think yeah. that's changed a lot of people as well. Yeah, that's a, that's a, very, that's a very, very good point and, 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 and that, backs, that backs up my comment of, of how we must support one another and going forward. Do you use binoculars or do you call off the TV or both? I close my eyes and I hope for the best. <laughs> <laughs> that's why his commentaries yeah, are so good. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit of, a little bit of both. Uh, these days, majority of the, the calls are off the TV because okay. most of the world is watching off the TV. Sure. So you're trying to give them the, the best experience Good and point. exactly yeah, what yeah. they're seeing. Because what you see from the binoculars and what you see from the TV can, quite be, can be quite different on the occasion. The other day I mentioned, I uh, looked across, looked like the horse was three lengths clear and there's probably only a neck or a half a length in it. So I was looking at the TV monitor, I looked across to the binoculars and there is quite a big difference. Okay. And then okay. the angle obviously at Scottsville, that's a nightmare. Sometimes it can catch you out. There sure. was a short head the other day, Mount Greylock. I was confident it won a neck. Looked almost a dead eat. It won a short head. Sure. And then the last race, Varvacious, I committed. I yes. thought it just won. It won almost three parts of a length. <laughs> so that's one of the things that you can never get over. You, yeah. you second guess yourself when they come past the post. When they yeah. go past, you're almost certain. And you know... You, you also, and you always, you know, you'll always, the commentator will always say, oh, but it's close, let's go to the judges or whatever. And they have, they have to, you've got a split second to commit. So, you know, and if they happen to get it wrong, well, so be it. You look at the slow mo, look at the rerun, but your first thing that comes to your mind, it was vivacious, and who was the other horse? Can you remember? Vivacious was on the outside. Two or three of them on the inside, yeah. all yeah. dashing through. Pardon? Maquette. 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 Yeah. You know, you say vivacious, Maquette, maybe vivacious, you know, and if Maquette had won it, I mean, it's so close, but. Your instinct told you, you know, and you just got to cut people mm. slack, is what I'm but saying. But you know, apart from from commentating with binoculars, I remember in the old days when the press box was still a press box. There were lots of people there. Now you hardly ever see a pair of binoculars on the race. Yeah, um, yeah. But you watch. I used to watch races. Every race we'd been, to, and you see things with binoculars that you can't pick up on the TV. Yes. It's just weird. And. I used to be a much better tipster in the old days when I used to sit up there with, with, with binoculars. Well, I tell you what, from the commentary box, you pick up so much at the punt. We try and give them as much information. Mm -hmm. For instance, that horse Shavut the other day. Shavut yes. and a couple of other horses. Once they go out of shot and there's so much that actually happens. It's yeah. frightening. You pick up on those things. And even a horse like Prince Vion. They go down to the start, you can see they stirred up and they're not on picture for a few seconds yes. and something goes wrong. And a lot of the time you try and give it to the punters. And like you mentioned, when you pick those things up and you're upstairs, you get a whole lot more information. Yeah, you get a lot, lot better view. I, <laughs> we should actually sit up there with binoculars for every race. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. How do you remember the colors, Sheldon? How do you, it's another question that my dear old mother was asking. How do you remember, how does, I, 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 well it's not about everybody else, it's about you. How do you remember your silks? I'm lucky I've got a photographic memory. From a young age, I've been able to, when I see something, it sticks there. Not in my schoolwork. When I saw <laughs> stuff in schoolwork, I just threw out the bin. That was it, done and dusted. But I've been very fortunate. I've got a photo, like more or less a photographic memory. So when, the, when I see the colors and the names, 
obviously like you got the Mario Ferreira colors you got the Villunes sure. and they might have 10 or 12 runners on the meeting so you just got to make sure you put the right name to the right color yeah. and the right race yeah. and there we go so yeah. sometimes you are calling the race and you see the horse and like don't touch me for instance there's another chestnut horse that looks very similar once or twice it goes through your mind don't touch me and then you've got that other horse's name no, ringing yes, in the back yes. and you just make sure it's don't touch That's me right, yeah. and then when you watch the replay i mean I'm, I'm my own worst critic i go through a race and you just make sure everything goes as smoothly as possible as we all say we're all humans we make mistakes but we try and do the best of our ability and when you watch the replay, even the slightest error, you own worst critics. So I try and be a perfectionist, but we can't all be perfectionists. Not easy game, but we try our best. Um, yeah, that's uh, cause remembering colours. I mean, you know, we, it's, it's I only remember the colours of the horse that I've backed. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, for you, I mean, if you, if you open the computer form, we talk uh, African skyline, love the view, the bayou, and that, I mean, as we talk horse names, you know, the bayou is Paul Lafferty, all orange, and it just, it's, it's like second nature. Second nature. Second I had a word with Paul Lafferty this morning. I know the bayou is going 1600 on Sunday. He expects it to win. So okay. African skyline. Yesterday, of course, the winners came through the there. So you know, line, the yeah, form yeah. lines are good. Okay. Basically, reading horses is like, is like family. They become part of your family. Okay. You get to know them very, very well. You study your colors, the form lines. And it's when you go Joburg, Cape Town, that's when things start getting trickier. I know when Alistair was sick and a while back in that, my dad and I used to travel to Joburg quite often. And that's when the game gets quite yes, tough because yes. it's, not, it's not your home territory. I used to call the PE races from the studio in Ravonia. And that was, it was a total different experience, yeah. calling Mauritius, calling the, the PE, the poly track, the different angles and that. But you've just got to adjust and apply yourself the best that you can. Yeah, sure. yeah that can't be easy. Okay, uh, last question, because I've run out of my list here. Uh, <laughs> the questions have run out. We can talk for hours, and it's been so informative. The, do you have uh, much of a relationship with uh, the rest of the commentators around the country? I mean, do you touch base with them every now and again or do you only see them when you're at the races or Brandon and all the team or, or do you just sort of everyone's so busy in their lives? I think beforehand when we used to travel and that we used to have a lot more interaction okay. and a lot more communication since COVID's come around and that obviously everybody's lives have changed a lot more segregation and people keep to themselves doing their own bits to try and survive in that. I've kept in touch with Trevor Denman and obviously with my dad being here. Alistair, I have a chat to every now and again and the boys. I used to travel to Joburg quite often, so I used to see Brandon. I used to okay. see Clyde Basil and all the guys. Bumpy Skuman, what a character. And Port Elizabeth when I used to go there, more than welcoming. you got Jahan Herber, Ravon Smith. I know them all very, very well. Okay. But as our lives are so busy, it's hard to keep in contact sure, with all sure. of them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, we're going to give the news... Uh, a skip to the end because let's go through the card. Come on, we all sparked up. Ouch. <laughs> Did you see that? Eh? I think you put electric current in here. It was a zapper, you. zapped yeah. you. Uh, let's talk about racing. On Sunday, the 12th of September 2021, we're at Hollywood Bets, Scottsville, and we have a eight race program. Let's go and we'll just give you what I call the microwave version, Andrew selection, Sheldon selection. I'll give you something to keep an eye out for and uh, you can just use it uh, as a guide, use it or don't use it. But the first race is at half past 12, a maiden played for fillies and mares over a thousand meters. And when this horse Poppy of Bayou ran last time, uh, Musi came back and he, he mentioned if it was a thousand meters, you know, she, he thought that she would have won. So I'm going to go with her just based on, on that comment, and I, I'm happy to share that comment with the viewers. But horses like Ancient Epic look to be uh, obvious dangers. How do you see it, Sheldon? What do you like? I'm in your camp, Poppy of Bayou. Last time out, I remember Duncan saying she's looking for further. She's looking for the 1400. But what I saw last time out, she's too pacey at this stage yes. of her game. You don't want to change a horse's running style at this stage. So I think dropping her to a thousand is the winning recipe. Ancient Epic would be the danger. But I believe Poppy of Bayou on her earlier reputation, she is a must for the first position in race one. Andrew, what did you tip in the official race card? I went Ancient Epic. Okay. I thought there was a good run last time out. And then uh, Leopard Lady ran in Scottsville on Sunday. And Had a good look at the track. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. MJ, MJ, MJ told me unbeatable. And then <laughs> that shell seeker came out and blew it away. Yeah, yeah but uh, Leopard Lady's going to win a race one of these days. And even a horse like Namakwa Dove has to be respected. But uh, looks like the general consensus is Ancient Epic and Poppy of Bayou. Let's move on to the second race then, friends. It's a maiden plate over 1,200 metres. 
I saw there's a horse. Did you own that horse, Shoot the Breeze? Yes. Yeah, because yeah. there's a horse running somewhere here that's out of Shoot the Breeze. Oh, right. And uh, uh, Duncan's just got one of the other progeny that's out of Shoot the Breeze by Willow Magic. So right, yeah, we had uh, Isinga Moya was, was yes, Shoot the Breeze. Yeah, okay. shoot, the, shoot the Breeze, we had a, we, we, with Mark Dixon. Um, she had a bit of an offset knee, and she, I think she won three races for us, two, two on the vol sand. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Sheldon, I know that you spoke to Natey Cotson this morning. What were the comments about uh, the brief? Because I'm quite upbeat about his chances. He was quite brief. He thinks it's going to go very, very close to winning. So I think that first run was a nice education. If you watch the replay, a horse is going to come on leaps and bounds. And also chatting to Yogis Govinda, he was most disappointed with number two master Kiku last time out. So I think these are the two horses that are going to fight it out. And then once you look beyond them... Maybe number eight, Proud Master. But I think number two and three, I think that's where your winner's going to come from. Andrew, speak up. You're you through. Know, I've gone Proud Master. I think the dryer stable is starting to fire now. I think they've found their feet and they've found the new recipe, and I think they'll win. Okay, so there it is. Uh, three, the brief, two, Master Kiku, and eight, Proud Master. Those are horses that you have to... Uh, keep an eye out for. Joshua Hot Snake, beautifully named, named after... Scratched. It was it scratched again? Because it was scratched, scratched yesterday. yesterday. Uh, uh, maybe, okay. Anyway, maybe whatever running, it is. Maybe running, whenever it runs, Joshua Hot Snake. It's see, I made a mistake. Okay. You see, you made a mistake. <laughs> Naughty. Minus 10 <laughs> points. Not allowed to do that. <laughs> Joshua Hot Snake, named after Jeff Perkins' uh, middle-aged middle son, Joshua. Joshua Perkins. And uh, we're going to see some fun names coming out of the Perkins family. Joshua Hot Snake. Let's move on to the third race. Maiden played 1,200 meters. I was bitterly disappointed, gentlemen, with number two, Geronimo, last time. I thought he would run a much better race. Uh, the comment in the computer form is that he rolled inward early. But c c can we expect better from him, Sheldon? I was have been very disappointed with him. That run when he was drawn towards the inside, I thought after he ran right across the track, that was the day for him. He's only got the one R, so he has been quite disappointing. So I'm going to pass him by this occasion. It depends how good number one venerable is. If this has got any ability, it'll probably win. But I've got a nice shrewd here. Number seven, Fiery Duke. Fiery Duke, Gareth Wright, the Barden Horse, and Kennedy combination. Cast a shoe last time. And if you watch the replay, actually moved up very, very dangerously at the 300 and then just faded out of contention. So he has a nice roughy, and I believe this horse is going to find good support on the day. Okay, fiery duke. When I often say when Dees talks, we listen. When Sheldon talks about roughies and things, we, we listen. listen. So there's fiery duke. How have you uh, tipped I'm it? Geronimo. I'm Geronimo. Geronimo. Okay, so you're going to give Geronimo another chance. With a parachute or with that? Without. <laughs> <laughs> I am um, not going to tip anything here because to be quite frank with you, I'm going to have a bet on the day. Not a race goes by without me having a bet, but there's nothing really that jumps out at me at this point in time. The fourth race, let's move on. It's a merit rated 86 handicap, 1,950 meters. Now this was Shavut. We spoke about Shavut. You know, we saw his antics in the parade ring. We saw his antics uh, on the way to the start. How many more chances are we going to give him? That's the question well, listen, I'm he's asking. Got, he's got three pacemakers in the race. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, if he doesn't get it right this time, then I'm a bit worried. Unfortunately, Movie Magic was scratched last time, which was supposed to be, I thought, the pacemaker to stretch them out. But obviously, Shavut, they would have had done their homework with him, and he's a horse with a reputation. But now he's got to prove it. Like you mentioned, he's had his chances. They've got to keep him settled. And from that experience, let's just hope that the horse whisperer and MJ have got to the bottom of him because he's a horse who can boil over. Yeah, he certainly is. I'm going to give him another chance. How did you tip it? I'm giving no, him no, another I, chance. I if it, for me, he's a banker. But There's okay. not much in the field. There's not no. much in the field. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I said he should have everything his own way with... with Pacemakers and <laughs> <laughs> Are we happy to say we're giving him one more chance? He yeah. might end up going to the front. <laughs> no, no, no. Wise, I spoke to Wiseman this morning. He's got 48 on his back. He said, he's hey, going to the he front. Said, I, think we, I think we have to make the pace, he said to me. Okay. Uh, All right. So, had his instructions yet. General consensus is we're happy to give it another chance. Yeah, let's, okay, give, him let's chance. give him another chance. Okay, fifth race. 75 handicap over the mile. It's at 10 to 3, 14, 50. And for me, nine Walton Hall, ten two of us look to be uh, principal contenders. But Paul Lafferty, you say, is confident with the Bayou. It's a competitive race. It's not as easy as a two-horse race. No. 
No, it is quite competitive. Number one, Tashman. The last time he won was from a one draw. I think it was the 26th of December last year. So if you go back in the form line, his last win was from the, the one draw. So he's a draw strike. He's a very difficult customer. He's not a straightforward ride, Tashman. So I think from a one draw, they can bounce him out. He can go lead. He can sit second. And the Bayou is probably the horse they all have to beat. He was once in the, the 90s, he's down to 76, and I believe he's a better turf horse. So between Tashman and the Bayou, those will be my top two, but not ruling out the horses that you mentioned. Have you got some others to add for us? Because it's a, it's a tough yeah, I race. I think it's a tough race. I went African Skyline. I thought he went really well the last time out. Yes, and that form line that we said is starting to spark up nicely. Yeah. Yes, yes, indeed. Okay, so, so you went African Skyline from? Uh, from Walton Hall. Okay, so there we uh, go. And Command Control, Spooky's horse. Command Control, worth a mention, absolutely. As you can see, friends, a lot of horses that are worth mentioning. Yeah. Try and load up. Fill but up. you've heard what uh, Sheldon <laughs> likes, what I like, and what Andrew likes. So we're going to move on to the sixth race, a 70 handicap for fillies and mares. 1,400 metres, talking about giving horses more chances. Maiden's prayers here, and uh, she's certainly got to have a chance. But I'll start with you, Sheldon, uh, for your, your opinion or your selection. Well, I spoke to Stuart Ferry this morning. I said, finally, we get Maiden's Prayer on the turf 1400 where she won her maiden. She's been very disappointing. She was in the 90s. She's dropped right down to a 70. I think she's 22 points down in the ratings. On her earlier form, she'd be an absolute blinder, but she's an underachiever. So how many times can you follow them? Number two, Tango Time, I liked a bit of last time and a big price. Watch the replay. Never got a run. The rider couldn't ride from the 200, just eased her out. So I think Tango Time's the big improver. And number seven, Amkamazi, with the weight off the back. And then number 10, Humdinger. But for all we know, number one, Maiden's Prayer, she might come and win by five. Yeah, she would be deserving of another victory because uh, she's been making us wait, that's for sure. How did you uh, predict it? I went Amkamazi, I thought there was a... Uh, once it's an improving, improving. Okay, yeah. And Rachel yeah. Venica, wow, she's it's certainly like riding well, isn't yeah, she? Yeah, she is. Okay, but a difficult race. A horse like Humdinger skated clear to beat Gravey comfortably last time. So another con uh, another competitive race awaits. Racing at the moment is not easier. No, no, it's no. not easy. It's it's competitive and uh, it's 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 exciting. Right, so here we go. The seventh race is at the top of the hour, 4 o'clock on Sunday at Hollywood Bet Scottsville. It's exactly what we're doing here. The Horses to Follow podcast, uh, Philly, uh, Phillies and Mares 77 handicap, over 1,200 metres. And Dancer My Lord number two was obviously on an online sale because I see that's changed hands and that's changed trainers. I've had a good look at this field because not to be biased, not to be clever, not to be whatever you, you want to call it. Yeah. Well, I wish it was as easy as that that I own the winner. Uh, but Kitten's Adventure, yes, we have got a share with, uh, you know the, our partners, the Derek and Sajo, and you've owned horses We've owned with horses them. with them, yes. Lovely guys, and they're so passionate, and they love their horses. And, and I'll start with her, the filly, because uh, I think she's very well handicapped. Uh, or for 76, I think she's uh, well weighted, 53. She's won over the course and distance. She beat October Song. October Song has come out and won. The word from the yard is that she's tightened up and she's come on a lot from that performance. And I think she'll run well. To say she's a good thing, uh, there's no such thing as a good thing, but the opposition's not the greatest. You know, yeah, what well, do you always well, think? Well, Let's done, start with you. Yeah, Dance my Lord. I mean, run, it's running two features. That's the horse to beat, I think. Yeah. Uh, now it's moved to Doug Campbell. But I think uh, Kitten's Adventure, I watched her this morning. She's looking very, very well. Uh, and I thought there was a good run behind uh, the head of October Song who came out and bloody piddled him the other day. Yeah. So I think it was a good effort. Charles, what do you think? I'm sitting on the fence here. I think you got a, a big case, Dance My Lord, the four kgs off, Kitten's Adventure, and Sav Star. I think she, she's going to run an absolute cracker, but there's not much of her. She's got the 58, Kitten's Adventure, the 53, and Dance My Lord will get the four kgs off. So... Competitive fillies and mares handicap here. Sav Star, if you had to put me in the corner, I'd probably go the 10 just on the horses that she's taken on. But I'd have healthy respect for Dance My Lord and also Kitten's Adventure. Yeah, an interesting race. It, it's an exciting race, a 77 uh, handicap. Just the thing, uh, uh, Jared Samuel, he's headed off to Hong Kong pretty soon. Hong Kong? Yeah. Is he gonna, okay, okay. You know, he said he's got his, his visa and everything, and now they're just sorting out the things. He's, he's got to... Uh, He's going on into quarantine in the Maldives. 
the Maldives. For what a place to go. For 21 days. Lovely. I said to Jesus, <laughs> extend it to a month. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah make sure the quality I have it a month yeah, is to be sure. Else? But uh, Luke Ferraris did that. He went, uh, uh, Luke Ferraris went to Maldives, Maldives yeah. Hong Kong. Yeah. And uh, wow, he, the pictures that he had on social media. Yeah. What a place, what a... Oh, I, mean, I said to Jared, you better take, take goggles and a snorkel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Must give us the time of the flight and when he's leaving, yeah, we'll, get we'll, in, we'll get in the luggage. We'll yeah. get in there, absolutely. But yeah, the seventh race, competitive, Phillies and Mares handicap. Let's see how it unfolds. Obviously, I want Kitten's Adventure to win, uh, but it is competitive. It's not a one-horse race by any stretch of the imagination. Who's calling on the weekend, you or your dad? The weekend will be my dad. Okay, so please ask him to call it home for us. The eighth race is the Hollywood Bets Bright Future 73 handicap, 1,200 meters. Now, this was Quattro Pussy uh, for Ivan van Veik and Barry Marais, Musi Yeni. Gate one up the straight, 54 kilograms. I know it's been 311 days since his last one, but he's starting to show signs of getting it right, wanting to get it right now. I actually went for him in quite a big way in his penultimate run. I went for two horses in the same race, and Quattro Passi was one of those I thought would be the improver. Has shown the necessary improvement. There's two horses that I like here. Number 10, Kimura. If he brings his A game, it's a matter of how far. I spoke to Tony Riverham this morning. He said he'll be most disappointed if he gets beaten. He's run to Captain Fontaine, Captain Tatters, but he's a bit of an enigma. He's best at Scottsville. But if he brings his A game, they believe he'll win. And number three, Odin. This horse has got me stumped. I just don't believe he likes the poly track. He's from the Louis Gerson stable. And the day he ran on behind Spider's Corner, I said, I'm going to follow this horse till he gets beat. He's back at Scottsville. He's dropped right down in the handicap. If he can bring his A game, I think that's the horse Kimura has, his, has to set his sights on. Yeah. What are your, is your opinion, Sheldon, on number 11, Purple and Green, and 12, Lunar Cam, two recent maiden winners, but chatting to connections of both, they seem to rate their horses. Yes, they seem to be very nice horses. Purple and Green is coming back from quite a layoff, so it'll be interesting to see how this individual goes. Lunar Cam, we saw the form lines franked. I think there's been two winners out of that, but with carrying the 61 and a half, Kimura's got the 60 and a half, so there's a kg between them, and Odin's got the 55 on the back. Luna Cam is rated by the stable, but when it comes to horses out the maidens, I usually sit on the fence. fence. I'd rather go the places on Odin and a couple of wins on Kimura. If Luna Cam had to win, I wouldn't be shocked, and so far, he's a soldier. Yeah, it's, it's the right way to do it with the maidens. You sit on the fence, see how they perform, and, and take it from there. But how did you tip it? I went Kimura. Okay. I think it's a good thing. Okay, so there we go, Kimura. Well, we must get Sheldon on here. He's much more pretty educated than we are. Oh, well, that's why he's on the show. That's why he's on the show. What are you talking <laughs> we about? We try, we yeah. try. And uh, he's giving us some value. He's giving us some uh, some followers. And uh, I'm sure that we're going to get some wonderful comments. Please comment on our social media, on our Gold Circle page, on the podcast, and share your knowledge, share your selections, share everything. It's not a competition to see who's better than one another or who tips winners, who tips losers. It's about uh, opinions. It's about uh, thoughts and about what you like, what I like. Sheldon might like horse A. Andrew might like horse B. I might like horse C and the horse X. Got his hand up. Uh, our, pr our producer He's wants got to a add tip. He's, He's got, got a got tip. tip. What can we back? What should they comment about? Should comment about. Uh, yeah, but you're being vague. Vague. Okay. Uh, what are we going to do about this producer of ours that wants me to not be vague? Fire him. Fire him. Stick him on a horse at 60 k's an hour. Yes, we'll put him on a horse. What do they think about Sheldon Peters? No, we don't want to. We want to know what they like and, and, and what horses they like. And yes, about Sheldon and about us because Sheldon brings value and, and everybody brings something different. So, so to the viewers, you bring something different. Tell us what you like. Tell us what you don't like. But as we say it always... It's not a hate show. So any comment that's out of line will be deleted and will be blocked. Tell us what horses you like. Tell us what information you want to hear. Best Add to the show. Maybe the best race that Sheldon has called. The best tip that you've got. Do it again Sheldon. when in the July. That's what I'd go. Do yeah, it well, again. It's this, that's the, in his opinion, that's his, his best call. And maybe the, uh, a, a selection that he's given you or one of us have given you that have won, share it with us. Share a good experience with us. And try and tip us a winner. You happy with that? No, I'm happy with that. Yeah, listen, all it's to it's nearly winner. Christmas. Can we carry on? <laughs> <laughs> You're not enjoying your show. This is amazing. 
It's amazing. There we go. Relax now. Relax. All, I, all I can say is, if they got the negative comments, they got to step into the ring with me. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now I'll let's go. Referee. Let's go. Okay. Now the news. Before we wrap up, we've got to just rattle through the news. We don't entertain any negative comments. We want a happy, fun show. JP Funamurva. Shame. I think you got hard done by. You got a year. Sure. For not trying. According and I haven't seen the race. You haven't, haven't seen, seen the, race, the race either. But the few people that I've spoken to that uh, have seen the race said, in their opinion, he was trying his hardest. Have you seen the race? No, no I haven't seen. Haven't it. seen. Okay, so a bit oh, harsh. One year. A bit of a harsh. Yeah. Okay, there's a new tab gold feature. Well, it's not that new. I don't know if you ever use it. It gives you an automated uh, computer prediction of the race. It plays out the last 300 meters or the last. 100 meters, and it gives you a computerized prediction. Have you any, any of you used that yeah, feature? I've, I've seen it. I haven't used it. No, I haven't used it I haven't either. used it. Um, I know that a lot of people go for, like in the winning form, there's that predicted times, you know. A lot of punters follow that. I don't particularly. Maybe I should start. I might win a few pounds. Uh, but this is that Tab Gold feature. Uh, go onto Tab Gold website, and you'll see it's called the Race Predictor, and it marries everything together. Whatever floats your boat. And uh, whatever helps you choose winners, use it. Because it's not easy to find winners. Uh, track and ball are opening up at Hollywood Bets Gravel. They call it the finishing post. Which, as we're saying, we're having a little laugh. It should be, uh, what do we call it? Because no, it's not on the finishing post. Past it's post. just after. It should it's be past, past the post. The post. Yeah. Um, but it's right there. That's what there. we want our horses to be, past That's the That's where we want yeah. them to be. So new track and ball where the club tab used to be at Hollywood Bets Gravel. Just after the finishing post, there's a beautiful facility there that's being renovated, and that'll be your new track and ball outlet. And we're going to do some podcasts from there, just letting you know. Yeah. Uh, okay. So your car will have like to go. Like you got a choice. Oh. Yeah, like you got a choice. And your car will have to go uh, a bit further uh, yeah, than the toll gate. I'll have, I'll have to uh, re, re, uh, re, what, rearrange my, my GPS. Yes. Mm. Uh, yesterday there was a winner, and Sheldon, you would have met them. Andrew, you know them very well. That was with uh, Mark, not with Mark Dixon, with uh, Yogis Govender. Uh, they were Spooky Humby and they were another trainer. Rainbow Spirit. Uh, yes, Rainbow yes. Spirit, lovely yeah. bunch of youngsters. Brandon Galliard, tell us more There's about Brandon Galliard is uh, Jared Eady, Carl Storky, and Chad Britz. Jeez, you've got a good memory, yeah, eh? The, yeah, the four of them. They, they, well, they come up to Ashburton, but you never get a word in because. Um, because Brandon never stops bloody talking. <laughs> the I excitement was yesterday. Was, he, was, he was bloody. W- Speechless yesterday, which I thought was strange. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but and and I, I, I but but I, I like the question. I said to him, I said, just quickly before we go, I said, what is it? Share with the viewers, share with the world. What is it about racing that you love? And he just and he said exactly. He said that adrenaline. Yeah. He said that rush. It's a rush. And, and no. that's what we want to get But they're out passionate, I tell you, though. They really enjoy it. Good their boys. They're 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 good Andrew, the winners in closure yesterday. You would have thought it was the July lead, and they were yeah. so happy. And yeah. that's how it should be. Yes, yeah. that's how it should be. So well done to them. Um, the, the young owners. KZN bre- well, breeding season in South Africa. Uh, foaling, I see on all the sporting posts and on all the websites and on all the Facebook. A lot of foals being born, a lot of new stallions having their first foals. So uh, covering season is going to start soon. So there's lots of activity in the breeding season. Yeah, I know. It's not my best season because the blokes are so busy I can't go fishing. Yeah, the, you know, it blocks off the dams. Yeah, you can't blocks get off onto the, the dams. Yeah. Um, and I think that's about it, really, from us. That's a bit of news. We've gone through the card. We've learned about Sheldon. It's been the most informative show. I know Andrew's going to say it was a very long show, but we don't worry about what Andrew says, do we? No. no. Okay. So you, you see, you've got no choice. Um, Sheldon, from all of us, thank you for your time, and uh, thanks for your, your input, and thanks for everything that you do for racing, because like us, you can, you know, you, you're sick for the game, you're passionate for the game. Everything you do is for the betterment of horse racing, like we all do. And, and all our colleagues and friends, so thank you, and it's been wonderful chatting. No, it's only a pleasure. We can always try and accommodate and help and give as much information as we can. Really enjoyed being on the show and looking forward to the future. Andrew, thank you. Eh? Thanks for making the trip. Oh, no, Don't no. turn your back on me again. <laughs> eh? I'll be very upset. Lucky we get breakfast. Eh? I've just remembered. I must explain to the people about MGT Solar. We've, dis- we've disowned our sponsors. No, I can tell you. I've written it down and I'm going to read it word for word so you can understand exactly this. MGT Solar are a renewable energy company that owns a cryptocurrency bedded in an immutable blockchain to raise funding to build solar plants to satisfy the ever-increasing demand for clean green energy. That's beautifully put. 
That's exactly what they are. MGT Solar. And I had to read it because I, I'm not like Sheldon. I haven't got a photographic memory. So thank you to MGT Solar for their sponsorship of the Horses to Follow podcast. We look forward to building the relationship with them going forward. Watch the insert that, uh, that um, Tawanda puts in at the top and at the tail of this uh, podcast, and you'll learn all about MGT Solar and how to get hold of them. From Andrew Harrison, Sheldon Peters, Warren Lenferno, we thank you for your contribution. Stay safe, be kind, and as always, one of us will see you from the winner's enclosure.